My name is Chris Burkett. I teach history and political science here at Ashland University, and I'm co-chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program at Ashland University. Uh, so this webinar is part of our series this year um, on presidents and their times. So if you're joining us for the first time today, the purpose of this is to pull together some thoughtful scholars, and we've got two very interesting uh, folks with us today to talk about presidents, and in particular, we're talking about uh, Dwight Eisenhower, Change at Home and Challenge Abroad, and we've recommended some readings for you to take a look at to provide some starting point for the conversation today, and hopefully we'll get a chance to, to draw from some of those documents and um, maybe get a little bit of background and explanation on, on, uh, on what is in those documents as well. Uh, before I introduce our, our, uh, our panelists today, let me mention that if you're joining us as a participant, you will receive an email in the next uh, week with a link that you can follow to request a, a certificate of participation. So look out for that email, and uh, if you need a certificate of participation, you can, you can click on that and, and, and request it. Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the, the two thoughtful gentlemen that are joining me today. Uh, Joe Postel is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, where he teaches courses on American political institutions, American political thought, and administrative law. He's the co-editor of Rediscovering Political Economy and also Toward an American Conservatism, Constitutional Conservatism uh, During the Progressive Era. And uh, Joe teaches in our Master of Arts program, and I had the pleasure and honor of teaching a course on the Progressive Era with Joe a few years back. So uh, thanks, Joe, very much for joining us this morning. Glad you could take time off from your uh, trying to set Congress straight about things uh, to talk about Dwight Eisenhower today. Full time job. Yeah, <laughs> right. Also, we're very happy to have David Alvis joining us. He is Associate Professor of Political Science at Wofford College, where he teaches courses on American politics, including the American presidency, constitutional law, and political parties. And David is co-author of The Contested Removal Power, 1789 to 2010. And David also teaches frequently in our Master of Arts program, including courses on the American founding, which I also had the pleasure of teaching with you once, I think, right? So That's ago. correct. Yeah, and also the Progressive Era. And didn't you teach a course on Herman Melville? I did. I taught a course on Moby Dick. That was a lot of fun. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, thanks again for both of you, uh, uh, to both of you for joining us today. I'm going to start with um, just a really broad question, and then we'll see where the program goes. Uh, and before we do that, I want to uh, just let everybody know that uh, everybody joining us, please feel free to submit questions in the chat box. And uh, we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. So I'll try to pass those on to uh, to professors Alvis and Postel, uh, and they also might notice them in the chat box. And feel free to jump in on any of those questions at any time. But my my first question, just to start the conversation, is a very broad one and open-ended one. I just want to know from both of you whether you think Rose, I'm sorry, Eisenhower deserves to be counted among the best of presidents, and if so, why? And if not, why not? I'll let you, either of you start with that question. Or, or feel free not to answer that question. Just talk about whatever the hell you want to Joe, talk you want to start? Sure, okay, yeah, I was, I was deferring. But um, so one of the things I did as I was sort of thinking about the question of Eisenhower uh, was I, I just quickly looked up the last 16 presidential ranking surveys. Um, some of these are the general public, some of these are historians. And some interesting things about Eisenhower. Um, in the last 16 presidential ranking surveys, Eisenhower is in the top 10, ranked in the top 10 in 13 of those 16. He's ranked in the top 12 in every single one. And he's ranked in the top seven in only two. So it's interesting. There's a pretty general consensus among the public as well as historians that he's somewhere between seven or eight and 10, um, putting him behind the greats like the ones you see on Mount Rushmore, or the Washingtons, the Roosevelts, the, the Lincolns. But everybody seems to think that he's right there as one of the great 20th century presidents and one of really the great, you know, one of the very best we've had, at least top 10. Um, for my personal opinion, I have no idea 
whether he's ranked too low or too high. And one of the things I'm hoping to get to as I think through this question with you guys is whether that's too generous or not generous enough. Um, the reason I'm not sure is because I think Eisenhower's an enigma to us, and I think he tried to be an enigma to people like us who might try to figure him out. Um, he could have run as a Democrat. The Democrats tried to draft him for president in 1948. They failed. Uh, he clearly rebuked his own party, the conservative wing of his own party. He governed very moderately. He used the phrase, modern republicanism was his slogan. <laughs> A very sort of progressive idea, right? That we're going to bring the Republican Party out of its anti-New Deal position into the modern age, finally. Um so, you know, he says things that sound like a progressive. He says things that sound like a conservative. Uh, and then the, the last thing I'll, I'll maybe point out as a factor here that we might talk through is what his view of the presidency was, because you could make the case that Eisenhower was the most restrained 20th century president after Franklin Roosevelt. And I think that you can make that case very convincingly. But there are a lot of scholars out there that say he only appeared to be um, withdrawn and and reserved and restrained as president. And in fact, he actually did so much behind the scenes that it's a little bit devious and a little bit um, underhanded, or the way that the scholars describe this is he, he exercised the hidden hand presidency. So in a way, I think he tries to sort of avoid these categories. He tries to have it both ways. And I don't know if that's in his, something we should praise him for or something maybe we should question. Yeah, I think fact. By the way, Joe, you raised several of the questions I was hoping we'd get into today, especially what was Eisenhower's uh, relationship to the Republican Party? Is he a conservative or a liberal? But your last point, I'll just mention really quickly, David, I want you to jump in here, uh, is that, that you're right. On the one hand, it seems like a uh, self-restrained, progressive-minded president is an oxymoron. <laughs> or, an, as you put it, an enigma. So how do we, I'm hoping we can sort of uh, unravel some of that in our conversation today. Well, I mean, one thing I would uh, just add, I, I think I followed uh, Joe and in, in how he generally characterizes uh, Eisenhower. And I guess one way of approaching the question is, uh, where do we rank Eisenhower? Do we rank him among the best of presidents? Um, if you think in terms of the monumental presidents, right, like uh, FDR or Lincoln or Washington, does he belong in, in that category, right? Does he belong, does he belong, if you added an extra face to Mount Rushmore, does he belong there? And I think the answer is no, and that would be no discredit to Eisenhower because Eisenhower's presidency is really about the modest assertion of executive power. And in some ways, what characterizes Eisenhower overall is his modesty and his moderation, as you can see from that letter uh, to Edgar uh, Eisenhower, to his, his uh, brother, um, moderation is the essence uh, is the essence of his presidency, and so you, I, I think he would never want to be regarded as a monumental uh, president, uh, primarily because I think he didn't see min the circumstances of his time as necessitating that. Uh, I think he thought he felt he fit into a time that required uh, moderation. He comes right after FDR and Truman. So he inherits the legacy of the New Deal, but he has reservations about the intervention of uh, the scale of the intervention of government uh, as a Republican. So on the one hand, he doesn't want to dismantle the New Deal establishment. On the other hand, he doesn't want to try to curtail it to some degree. But he doesn't want to uh, establish a whole new order in the same way that, say, uh, FDR does with the New Deal. So in some ways, he doesn't fit as a monumental president, and he never really aspired to be such. The other question is whether or not he's a good president, that is, whether he's a, a model uh, for others. And I, here I, I'm kind of of two opinions. Um, on the one hand, uh, Eisenhower's uh, legacy really shows that you can um, that you can exercise uh, a certain amount of moderation and be liked in American politics, as the uh, sobriquet um, "I like Ike" uh, slogan uh, demonstrates. And that is, um, he was very efficient at finding, uh, usually at finding a middle ground, and he was enough of a political strategist to be able to know how to maintain uh, 
uh, a middle ground, both on domestic policy and on foreign policy. So, you know, today in our sort of highly uh, polarized uh, politics, uh, Eisenhower does provide an example that you can you can uh, aim at the middle and, in fact, be fairly successful in, in achieving it. On the other hand, the problem with Eisenhower's moderation is that there's really two types of uh, moderation that a president can have. One is when you have very strong principal convictions, uh, but then you tailor those convictions to the realities or circumstances of your age. And um, the, the, a good example of that would be a, a Lincoln who has a very clear understanding of the principles that animate his executive, uh, his policies, but on the other hand, understands that uh, dealing with the various contentious factions of his age, you have to aim at a certain middle ground. Then there's the kind of president that aims at a moderation because moderation is just sort of an end in itself. And I'm sort of inclined to see Eisenhower in the latter category as someone who just saw moderation as an end in itself. And the problem with that position is I think that it can lead to a lot of confusion. So when we begin to talk about some of the details of his foreign and domestic policy, um, I'd like to flesh out a little bit, I think, uh, some of the problems that you can have when you simply see moderation as an end in itself rather than a sort of way of accommodating your principles uh, to the reality of contemporary politics. David, can I just can I just push that a little further? That's really interesting. The whole phrase "modest assertion of executive power" is a re is really interesting. But on that on your last point, if I understood what you were saying correctly, um, are you suggesting that Eisenhower saw modesty as an end in itself because he wasn't clear in his own mind about what his principles were? Or were his principles overly complex or overly simple? I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, yeah. What, are, yeah, what, are, what are Eisenhower's principles? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, so Eisenhower, he has sort of, um, he has some uh, principles that kind of a traditional Republican uh, opposition to the New Deal, and that is, is that he does like uh, a limited role for government uh, in the economy, um, but he's never really clear on why that's good. I mean. He tends to have slogans like, you know, individual enterprise is good, but he's not very clear on why he why he's kind of committed to the Republican platform of limited government. And so that in some ways, his policies really actually end up being very confusing. They're usually a mixture of private and public uh, cooperation and uh, which is not unusual for the Republican Party. That was characteristic of Hoover's. Uh, Hoover's presidency, but Hoover, uh, as an engineer, had a very complex understanding of how government and um, and, and private enterprise could could cooperate. Um, Eisenhower had a sort of vague notion that somehow public uh, 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 government and, and private corporations should be uh, cooperating, but not a very clear sense of even what that meant. And so I think a lot of his policies and positions ended up being confused. I mean, one thing he was always quite clear about domestically was that he wanted a balanced budget, which uh, out of his eight years as president, he got uh, three times. Um, and But the, the thing is, is that um, while he was very committed to fisc uh, a balanced budget, it was never particularly clear why or exactly, you know, what constituted a, a balanced budget. So balancing your budget is a matter of balancing revenues and uh, from taxes, right, and uh, and spending. And they, you know, in, in, in some ways for Eisenhower, it was the important thing was to have a balanced budget, but it didn't matter whether or not it was the spending that you were cutting or the taxes that you were cutting, as long as somehow it ended up balanced. And that's sort of characteristic of the lack of clear convictions on his part of exactly what um, uh, what the what federal what what principles ought to guide uh, federal policy. So he often found himself really more at odds with his own Republican Party than he did uh, with Democrats. He often found that he he got more cooperation uh, from the Democratic Party than from members of his own political party. Can I push that point actually a little bit further? Um, so. Uh, yeah, he, Eisenhower fights with both wings, actually, of the Republican Party. He fights with, obviously, Robert Taft all the time. 
Um, <laughs> that, that, that dynamic really defines a lot of his relationship with the Republican Party, Taft being very sort of libertarian, conservative, and trying to push the Republican Party in that direction. And really, Eisenhower's prominence prevents the Republican Party from going hard right for a few decades, maybe. Um, but then he fights with Nelson Rockefeller. There's a great letter he writes to Rockefeller where he uses the word progressive over and over again, but he's attacking Rockefeller for being too liberal. And he's saying what progressivism really is about is uh, moving slowly and incrementally and modifying, but, but in balance with the rest of what's already in place. I think there's a, there's a passage from the farewell address that gets to the question of what Eisenhower's principles are. And I've actually never used the um, so I, the technological question here. Can I point to that to that document here on the on the screen? Uh, I don't think we have it up. Uh, I don't know how to navigate the screen here, but there's a passage in the farewell the farewell address that um, actually I think gets at where this idea of moderation and balance. Um, if we can get it, it's on the second page of the farewell address. If if we can't get it on the screen, I'll just quickly kind of yeah. uh, read it. Or, why don't you put, point to us in the document and I'll see if our uh, if our uh, uh, student assistant can find a way to post this document. Yeah, so I have this. Um, there are two paragraphs. One, the first one starts with crises there will continue to be. Uh, so if we can get that up quickly, that's great. If not, I'll just quickly kind of uh, read through it and say why I think it's an important passage. Why don't you go ahead, Joe, because I, I circled that paragraph too. That's one of three paragraphs I circled in this. Okay, yeah. So he says, crises there will continue to be in meeting them, um, great or small. There is a recurring temptation to feel that some spectacular or costly action could become the miraculous solution to all our difficulties. Uh, and so you get this idea that progressives are going to propose this, you know, this miraculous, costly solution. Uh, here, let's, can I scroll this down a little bit? Uh, give it a try, Joe, and see if you can. You might have to go page number. Page, okay. Is it changing? I'm not sure who's in charge of it. Yeah, you're moving it. <laughs> I'll let the assistant um, manipulate this here. Find the crises. Can everybody? I'm not sure if you can see that crises at the bottom of the page there. We need to scroll it down. I'm not sure if we can see it. I'm not sure. Hey, uh, I'm not. Uh, Dennis is our student uh, assistant. I'm not sure who has, who has control over this. What? Page. What page did you say it's on? It's on page two for me. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. You're almost there. I can see it. I don't know if the rest of you can see it. Should I scroll this down a little bit? I think that's... Yeah, a little bit farther down. There we go. Is that showing up now? Yeah. Okay, and you can hear me. I hear a little choppiness in the auto. I just want to make sure I'm coming through okay. I can hear you fine. I think, David, David, your mic is a little choppy for some reason. Really? Yeah, I think it's because you're sitting back so far. I got a high-level professional mic here. <laughs> okay, so we've got this this passage highlighted. Um, crises there will continue to be. In meeting them, whether foreign or domestic, great or small, there is a recurring temptation to feel some spectacular and costly action is the miraculous solution to our difficulties. Right. So that's the kind of progressive liberal notion that he's going to attack here. That let's create a big centralized program to deal with the problem we're facing. And then in the next paragraph, I'll scroll this down just a little bit. Um, he says, each proposal must be weighed in light of a broader consideration, the need to maintain balance in and among national programs, balance between the private and the public economy, balance between cost and hope for advantages, balance between the clearly necessary and the comfortably desirable. He can't see balance and balance over and over again. Then he says, 
Good judgment bad. seeks balance and progress. Lack of it finds imbalance and frustration. And this idea of balance, the way David put it was moderation. I think, um, I do think this is the Eisenhower principle. Let's, let's sprinkle in a little bit of progressivism, moderate it with a little bit of conservatism. And this raises, I think, the question we're grappling with, which is, is that coherent or are you just blending in a bunch of principles that are kind of incompatible with each other? Um, balance for balance's sake doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, so so it's kind of almost that Eisenhower's just putting moderation and moderate policy forth as a principle, even though um, it's not really a principle. It's more of a strategy or a tactic or an approach. Yeah, that's very interesting, but, and it's even uh, this confusion is or, or what might appear as an inconsistency is compounded even further when you go further into the document where he starts talking about the conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry. This is the military industry industrial establishment problem that most yeah. of us are familiar with. But he, on the one hand, he says we need it. We've created it. We need it. And the conjunction of the two, but the conjunction of the two is something that we have to uh, be very conscious of. Uh, and one paragraph says, we must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or our demo democratic processes. So that there may be another attempt on his part to, to, to kind of find a balance or moderation. On the one hand, we need it, but we don't want it to get so large or out of control or be used in such a way that it endangers. Clearly, he's in favor of liberty and democracy, whatever those things mean to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it almost seems like muddling through at the end, right? Uh, so the military-industrial complex is dangerous, but obviously, we need a big military. So he's sort of just. You, sometimes you want to throw your hands up and say, "Okay, well, so what do you just kind of take half of this and half of that and put it together?" Um, the other thing about the farewell address is, uh, and I actually didn't notice this until I read this a few days ago again is he has two threats, right? The military-industrial complex is threat one. And then the second threat he calls the scientific-technological elite. Yeah. Um, the, the NASA scientists and all of the scientists working on health problems and all the scientists working on curing disease, that we actually will be threatening democracy by giving them so much influence and funding their research through the federal government, that it's going to become this sort of research state in which the scientific technological elite will take over. Um, and we all remember the first warning, and very few of us actually read through to find the second warning, and I found that to be very interesting. Yeah, he says, yeah, in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, there's the one side, right? <laughs> right. It'll also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. That's very fascinating. I actually didn't notice that either. Yeah, and what he says, the next pa the next paragraph right after that, and I, I think I know where we are, so I think I can find this quickly. Um, the next paragraph, right, he says, uh, actually it was the previous page here. He says, balance again. Right? He uses the, the, it is the task of statesmanship to mold, to balance, and to integrate these and other forces new and old within the principles of our democratic system. Okay, well, how are you going to do that? Right? How are you going to mold, balance, and integrate all of these things other than just throwing them all together and seeing how, how it shakes out? But I, I, well, I, and, I mean, I, I, I would add, too, you know, I, Eisenhower's approach to that, which I, I think, you know, it wasn't really fully appreciated until about, uh, until about 1990 when they had the uh, centennial of, um, of Eisenhower's presidency. And you get books like The Hidden Hand Presidency. It, it turns out that the way that Eisenhower deals with these situations is sort of through his own odd hoke uh, res uh, responses, which he, I mean, the, the, what, what, has, what scholars have begun to appreciate in Eisenhower is his ability to quickly move behind the scenes. But the, the problem with the odd hoax responses to uh, various, uh, to these situations where he would have tried to balance uh, various competing interests is that it would lead to a lot of confusion among uh, members of Congress, members of his own party, even members of his own staff about exactly what the policy is that we're attempting to pursue because it's all kind of in 
sort of in Eisenhower's mind. This is this is my odd hope response to balancing the various interests. So Eisenhower often found himself in situations where his staff would think that he was saying um, this is this is how this is how we should be approaching in principle uh, the intervention of the federal government in domestic affairs. Sorry about that. Um, but and 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 so they would come out with their own policy positions, and then Eisenhower would kind of erupt in anger at some of their statements because he thought it wasn't really consistent with the moderation or balance that he was pursuing. So one of his biggest problems was in the management of the executive branch, uh, trying to come up with a clear, coherent policy that other uh, uh, cabinet heads and, and, and uh, secretaries of various departments uh, could be, would be able to effectively and efficiently follow and formulate their own policies. Um, so this yeah, was a common problem, I think, throughout his presidency. Yeah, because you have, if, I believe, even under Truman, before Truman is out of office, you have the emergence of a, a relevant, relatively, well, not relatively, a pretty vast, far-reaching uh, bureaucracy largely created. I guess it may have come out of NSC 68 and other uh, attempts to create a coherent uh, uh, approach to, 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 to foreign policy, but you have the growth of this pretty vast um, foreign policy bureaucracy that often at times under Eisenhower is, is at odds with what he's trying to accomplish as well. And it seems like uh, he, he struggles a little bit to, to keep everybody on the same page as well. Um, at least that's what I, what you were saying, David, reminds me of that, that problem he was facing, so. Yeah, I think in, in, in certain cases, right, like in the Suez crisis uh, in Egypt, he had trouble uh, keeping the ally, his allies on the same page. Um, so that they were often confused by what exactly was the American foreign policy. So they would sometimes try to act on what they thought um, the America was leading and it was uh, was his uh, leading principles. And then uh, Eisenhower would claim, well, you know, that the French and the British have betrayed me uh, on uh, how we should deal, say, with with e with Egypt or. Uh, with uh, uh, Nasser's rule in, in Egypt. So, uh, I mean, the, I think that, you know, on the one hand, moderation and balance uh, is, a, is a desirable quality. On the other hand, it's got to be guided by some principle that can, uh, that others can follow. And here, I think Eisenhower had a difficult time articulating what that was. Yeah, can I just add one other thing really quickly then? There are actually several good questions that have been submitted along these lines. Um, uh, just back on Joe's point earlier, where he points out the problem of the uh, scientific intellectual elite, it reminds me also that, I mean, uh, I, I, sometimes I want to give, um, uh, I don't want to say give him the benefit of the doubt, but I can understand a little bit of, of his confusion uh, over some things. He is, after all, um, in the middle of, I guess, America is still trying to figure out the um, the full yeah, uh, I'm botching this. How do I say this? The the problem of of, of nuclear technology, right? The problem of, of atomic technology. I mean, that is a fundamentally new problem that we that no previous president, with the exception of Truman, had to really grapple with. And it seems like um, uh, Eisenhower, by the end of his term, as we see in the farewell address, he's he is leery of this scientific uh, intellectual elite community taking charge of things. But at times during this presidency, uh, he seems to embrace the possibilities that arise from uh, atomic nuclear energy, right? I mean, I'm thinking of his, of his speech before the UN, which I think was in 56, if I'm not mistaken, it might've been, might not have been 56, that's often just titled Adams for Peace, right? And there he gives this great speech um, where, he's, where he actually, if you get the sense that atomic energy, if developed uh, properly by uh, for personal uh, peaceful purposes by the scientific community can actually in the end lead to resolving the problems underlying the the tension between the free world and the communist world. So I also I often get the sense that he that throughout his presidency he doesn't quite understand what the role of science and technology actually is going to be in the world in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think you could see him struggling with this question uh, for good reasons, and that is that the Soviets really had not uh, 
until towards the end of his presidency, had not really developed an ICBM uh, that could carry a nuclear warhead um, uh, the distance of the United States. And so it's only towards uh, the latter end of, the, uh, of his presidency that that technology becomes available. So there still is a lot of thinking about what, where exactly these technological advances are, are going and what the speed of the development is. But in terms of you know, the, uh, Eisenhower's own attitude towards uh, scientific development, um, I always found his reaction to Sputnik to be somewhat surprising. And that is, he, he kind of shrugs with Sputnik, right? I mean, really, who cares? Uh, so they got something up in the atmosphere, right? I mean, his, really, his attitude was, this, this is uh, silly. And I think he also, too, thought that Kennedy's uh, space mission, or uh, moon landing, was a, uh, a silly enterprise as well. And the thing is, is that in some ways, his attitude here, I think, made him a little bit inept in responding to the public, uh, real public concern about the fact that the uh, Soviets had seemed to have beaten us uh, in the space race and that the space race might be, in fact, a, a, a really serious uh, and important scientific investment. So the, I, I think in some ways he underestimated the, um, the significance of these scientific advances probably because he was sort of committed to the traditional boots on the ground uh, approach to, uh, for, uh, to wars and to foreign policy. Yeah, actually, I wanted, a couple of people wanted to ask about that. I just wanted to mention really quickly, by the way, Dave. We know, of course, JFK, Kennedy, when he was running, he made a, he made a big deal out of that, right? He not only had uh, making claims like, um, or Kennedy supporters made claims that not only had, uh, had Eisenhower allowed a missile gap to emerge, <laughs> But a technology gap had emerged under Eisenhower's uh, presidency between the United States and the Soviet Union. And I think the example of his shrugging at Sputnik is a good, a good, good example of that. But we had um, Stacy uh, asked about, uh, with regard to the enigma and, and his responses and, and how Eisenhower dealt with these things, uh, whether that's a factor of his military mind, uh, his, his background as a general, generals like order. Uh, and top-down control, and uh, I wonder how frustrating it must have been for somebody like Eisenhower to not have that uh, that kind of control over the executive branch. Uh, somebody earlier asked a similar question. I'm trying to find it um, with regard to whether, oh, from Nick, whether Eisenhower's confusion might have been based on the fact that he came from a military background, or or perhaps even from his advisors, maybe some bad advisors, as um, as Eisenhower himself addresses in one of his letters, uh, I believe it was his letter to uh, Edgar. But what was uh, what was the influence of, of Eisenhower's military background on this thing, on his understanding of executive, uh, the presidency and executive power? I think, um, and I think David will probably have um, a very good response to this too. I think it does play a pretty big role. Uh, kind of the West Point training and and the mindset that he developed there. I think did play a large role in his desire to so achieve balance and also to bring in a lot of different points of view in order to make decisions. His his penchant for delegating decision making across uh, his cabinet and his advisors, which is one of the distinctive aspects of his presidency. I think that comes a lot from his military background. There's a great line from Truman as he's leaving the presidency where he talks about Eisenhower's inability to control the bureaucracy. And he says, um, Ike will sit here and he will say, do this, do that, and nothing will happen. Poor Ike, it won't be a bit like the Army here in the Oval Office. Right? Um, he won't get to actually be in charge as president. And Truman thought that Ike would have a very hard time dealing with that. The weird thing is, you know, aside, I mean, the, the Army experience might have um, pushed him to take a much more top-down leadership approach. And it turns out he actually is much more collaborative. Uh, this is the thing, by the way, I mean, one of the long-term effects of this is the effect it has on Nixon, who is uh, Ike's vice president and who also you know, is involved with cabinet meetings, is involved in the National Security Council, especially because Nixon was very interested in foreign policy. And Nixon, over his experience in the Eisenhower administration, basically says, when I become president, I'm going to do everything the opposite of the way Eisenhower did it. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> too many meetings, the cabinet people are advising him. He needs to just make a decision and then run the executive branch based on his personal decision. Very small inner circle rather than this big set of advisors that Eisenhower is creating. So one of the long-term effects of Eisenhower is actually it has a long it has it has much to do with the Nixon administration and the different direction that Nixon takes because of his experience as Eisenhower's vice president. Well, that's, that's, that's Thanks, Joe. Good, great. Uh, I also think um, generally uh, uh, generals tend to make uh, somewhat problematic presidents um, because generals, in, uh, at least from my my kind of scan of uh, the American presidency, generals generally hate politics. Um, the the they don't like they certainly don't like it in the uh, army, and they general and, and they uh, usually despise it in the army. And uh, also too, they when they come into political office, that that tends to be the thing that really uh, annoys them, and they often. Uh, are dismissive of 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 uh, politics in general, and I mean you see this I think throughout American history uh, with the example uh, both of Eisenhower and if you look at Grant, and in an interesting way I think it's actually true of Washington, right? That is Washington is kind of the one president you really don't think of as a as a uh, partisan, right? In fact, his farewell address is all is all geared towards arguing against partisanship, against political parties. Uh, so generals generally don't like uh, politics, and that's often uh, the reason that they're recruited is because usually when one party has been uh, out of power for a while, they look for somebody that will transcend partisanship as a way of advancing the, the political party, and that often is not the, the the best recipe. And so with Eisenhower, the, the big focus of Eisenhower's presidency was to make the executive branch uh, nonpartisan, to bring it beyond uh, in a, any partisanship. And the problem for Eisenhower, where he often gets bogged down, is in trying to deal with the partisanship. So for instance, the, the missile gap is a great uh, example. Um, the fact of the matter, the Democrats are always using something, uh, some episode uh, to illustrate a missile gap. And it was a demagogic move 90% of the time because as I think Eisenhower rightly estimated, there was no missile gap. Um, right. he, I mean, he was right about that. But the problem is, is that in order, you've got to spin that. You've got to be able to address these political uh, statements. You can't just assert, right, that I know the facts and my and and this is an internal secret. And so that for for Eisenhower, it was it was very. Uh, I think he he disliked politics, and therefore it made it very hard for him to come up with uh, a political uh, a political way of addressing uh, these issues. He simply thought, look, I I know I have the U2s. I know I have the uh, the intelligence. I, I know there's no missile gap, so I don't really feel compelled to respond to this. And that's I, I think that's the way a general thinks. But the problem is, is that it's not the way I think uh, that presidents who really have to be political uh, have to behave and have to think. That's that's really interesting. Enjoyed those comments, and I think there's a lot there um, to unpack. Uh, I hadn't really thought of the connection, the, the general's connection to Grant and Washington, but I think there's, a, especially with Washington, there's something to comparing Eisenhower to Washington. But there are a couple of questions that I would raise, and I want to see what maybe what David would do with these questions. Um, so one way of portraying this, as David has just done, is that Eisenhower is not political uh, and he hates politics. But as the hidden hand argument has tried to show, Eisenhower is very political in a certain respect. So he's not political in the um, respect that almost every modern president is political, going directly to the people, using rhetorical messaging, the bully pulpit, to um, push something through. But Eisenhower's very political in, you might say, the old Jeffersonian sense, yeah. working in back channels, um, not appearing to be out in front, but actually being behind the scenes playing a major role. And so in some ways, Eisenhower seems actually to be the most political president 
in the sense that instead of this disdain for politics, I'm just going to go to the people, get them on my side, and then I can bully people around. Eisenhower's really playing the game behind the scenes. You see this um, mostly, I th- most prominently with the with the way he handles McCarthy. Right. In that letter, uh, that's one of the four documents where he says, clearly I'm working on the McCarthy question, but I'm not doing it by talking about it in public. I'm doing it by... Um, subtle statements in public and then managing things like the censure hearings in the Senate, which Eisenhower was actually very involved with. And so this reminds of this reminds one of Jefferson, actually, where he says there's a famous uh, episode where Jefferson writes a bill, gives it to a member of Congress and says, go introduce this and pass this. Um, and then but he also adds this fo- the following. He says, and please uh, write this in your own handwriting and dispose of the original so that the president is not seen as meddling unduly with the proceedings of the legislature. <laughs> yeah. you know, remarkable, right? I mean, Jefferson writes a bill and then says, but I don't want to be, I don't want to, you know, meddle. So you write this exactly the way I've written it in your own handwriting and then you guys go pass it. And that seems to be one way of looking at Eisenhower as that kind of a president instead of Washington. So, how, what do we make of that, and how does that fit in with this way in which we're describing Eisenhower's disdain for politics? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a cushy question. So there's I mean, there's two sides of politics, right? There's one that's the PR relations, and then there's the other there's the other side of politics, right? Which is knowing uh, kind of how to make really good ad hoc decisions and uh, and, and being able to kind of uh, control the scene from behind uh, control the scene from behind the scene. And I, I can see that really Eisenhower was magnificent at that. He was really uh, uh, not only in the case with McCarthy, but uh, in a lot of foreign policy affairs and getting the votes in Congress, at least for the three times that he could get a balanced budget. He was very good at moving uh, behind the scenes. And that's really where he liked to be because he didn't like to be, um, he, was, he was notoriously did not like to be out in front of the uh, uh, press. The, the thing is, is though, it, the comparison to Jefferson, actually, I think is particularly helpful. And that is, is that uh, for Jefferson, right, the public image was, uh, the public message was one thing, right? Uh, limited constitutional, uh, limited government, uh, strict construction. But the reality behind the scenes was the wide wielding of unilateral executive power and really in some ways, you know, part of his message was, you know, Congress ought to be in control, but then what you do is, you basically control Congress from behind the scenes. And I, I think the, one of the problems for Jefferson's presidency was the, uh, the inconsistency between his uh, behind the scenes management and his public message. So this has always led, for instance, to the criticism of Louisiana Purchase as, the, um, uh, as sending a mix, mixed message about what the role of government ought to be and what the role of the executive branch ought to be. For Eisenhower, I think Eisenhower suffered in some ways the the same problems. His effectiveness behind the scenes left others, both in his administration and within his party, of being unable to say, okay, what really ought to be uh, the the policy uh, that's guiding that's guiding our decisions. And the, the McCarthy episode really kind of shows us, I say, in, in some ways, I think how uh, difficult a time. Eisenhower had in trying to manage a demagogue. Um, that is, most of the time, Eisenhower uh, had to avoid uh, a confrontation with McCarthy, despite the fact that he was utterly contemptuous of McCarthy. Uh, McCarthy had gone after one of his generals, General Marshall, claiming that you know he gave away China, and McCarthy. Uh, I mean, um, uh, Eisenhower couldn't take a, wouldn't take him on uh, on that issue. And, and when the, the thing that really finally got McCarthy was when McCarthy decided to go after the army and say the army is infiltrated with communists. Uh, it was at that point that Eisenhower could finally say, okay, that's enough, right? Uh, you know, you don't, I, I know the army, we're not, going, we're not moving into the army. Um, and so he invokes executive privilege and denies, um, denies McCarthy access. And this really allows uh, other Republicans in, in, uh, to finally break the McCarthy hold uh, in Congress in, in the Senate. So the thing is, is that I, I think in some ways the uh, while his re- his political skill behind the scenes is very impressive, uh, 
I think it, in the long run, it had it have the problem of not being able to uh, broadcast a clear or uh, a, a clear and coherent policy, and made them less effective. I think. Uh, on the public on uh, on the public stage, so that ultimately the party really couldn't capitalize very much uh, on his uh, years in, in office for the long term. And the um, I was trying to think of a uh, of another example of that, but let me let me turn it back to Chris for a second. Well, I was just I was just going to say really quickly, the, the perception is that the public perception is that because Eisenhower is, does not publicly denounce McCarthy. Which, of course, is what his brother wants in that letter that Joe mentioned and recommended, actually, the letter from Milton. The perception is that Eisenhower is soft on communism. And he does expose himself to the charge later, whether it's warranted or not, the charge later from, from Kennedy and Johnson and their administration that, that Eisenhower had been too soft on communism, both at home and abroad, and was not therefore really what he would consider a, hard, a hardcore cold warrior, even the way Truman had been. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, we mentioned this earlier, uh, the Kennedy administration uh, made a big deal out of this, uh, both when Kennedy was running and then once they were in office, by continually saying, we've got to, we've got to fix the, uh, we've, got to, we've got to make up for the, the lack of seriousness about combating, especially abroad, communism abroad. Um, but but it, I, it did, in a way, kind of tarnish, a fair statement or not, it kind of tarnished Eisenhower's reputation in a certain way. This whole McCarthy affair. Or did he come out of it uh, redeeming himself? Well, I, I will um, just say something quickly, because I want to hear David's response to this. I think he knows the foreign policy side of things a little better than I do. Um, but my sense of it is that the claim that Eisenhower was soft on communism is not entirely accurate uh, and was often used by his political opponents to score points regardless of whether it was a legitimate criticism. Um, the, you know, just one example of this, Nixon would remark during Vietnam, although he denied this after <laughs> he denied this after the fact, um, that one of the advantages Eisenhower had over Nixon in Vietnam was that uh, in the Korea conflict was that um, they really thought Eisenhower might actually drop the bomb. And Eisenhower deliberately cultivated that view that, hey, I, you know, sort of the madman theory, that I could do anything and therefore you have to be a little more restrained when you deal with me because I, I, every option's on the table in terms of my, what my potential response might be. And Nixon said, they know that we're not going to take dramatic measures in Vietnam and that ties my hands. So this is one example to show it seems like Eisenhower, just from, from the way I look at the history, wasn't actually as soft as most of his opponents claimed that he was. Yeah, that's interesting. What, what, what do we make, uh, David, I, I want to hear your response to this too, your thoughts on Eisenhower's, uh, on how, how, uh, how strong he was against communism abroad. But we, we, there's the interesting episode, however. I mean, we've got the, um, we, we recommended his special message to Congress on situations in the Middle East where he seems to be, Here's where uh, he articulates what comes to be known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. He draws a line in the sand, and he's he seems to be going pretty far here and calling for both economic and military support to resist the spread of uh, of Soviet influence in the Middle East. But but then you have the whole Suez Canal episode, yeah. um, which again I, I've struggled with this, and scholars have I think puzzled over what why he took the position he took on the Suez control, supporting. Uh, local control uh, by Egypt, uh, and and in a, in a gesture that seemed to really turn against the interests of our European allies at a time when it seemed we needed them most. So, David, please uh, elaborate on anything. But if I, either of you have yeah, any yeah. thoughts on the Suez thing, I would really appreciate it because I, I I don't claim to understand that. Yeah, the the Suez crisis was really uh, 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 complicated. So. You know, on, on the one hand, we were we, so we were promising Egypt, we were promising Nasser in Egypt, um, you know, sort of low interest loans and financial funding for the building of the Aswan Dam, which was was huge to Nasser. I mean, that would you know, you could provide over half the country uh, with electricity through the building of the Aswan Dam, and then uh, the the. Eisenhower administration decided, well, 
you know, before we're, there, there's going to be some conditions before we before we um, uh, before we fund this. One is is that you know you better not accept any funding from the Soviets. And so Nasser said, well, you better. Uh, Nasser's response was, uh, you 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 foot drag on this. I'll just I'll take the money from the from the Soviets. And so the the uh, the signals from the Eisenhower administration were not particularly clear, and they were insulted by the fact that Nasser said, you know, I'll play this demagogic game. I'll go to the uh, I'll go to the Soviets, and then um, and, and then uh, and then what he does is basically just steals from the British the entire control of the of the Suez. You know, British had you know the, uh, most of the interests uh, in the Suez, and and so uh, Nasser simply uh, just uh, uh, nationalizes the uh, the Suez and takes it over. And um, they are, they were uh, you know he uh, he was they, they, he was actually allowing traffic through there, but this had uh, obviously. Uh, anchored the uh, British and the French, who were also too helping to arm uh, the Israelis, uh, contrary to a, a, um, a treaty that we had had that, that the Middle East, the tripartite treaty that we couldn't, that, that um, Western countries weren't uh, supposed to be building up the arm, armaments of uh, Middle Eastern countries. And so then um, the French and the and the and the British assume that America supports right, taking back the Suez, and so they went ahead and, and did this and, and went ahead with military action. Um, when you know Eisenhower's real plan was to try to negotiate uh, a, a solution to this with with Nasser, and the, the I, th I think again the problem was the lack of of clarity about exactly. Uh, what the foreign policy crisis was. The other thing too is that I think um, I mean it's true that 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 uh, Eisenhower I, in his foreign policy he really was very anti-communist and very tough on communism and uh, on on potential uh, communist expansion. But the thing that I think Eisenhower often confused in his foreign policy was nationalist movements. Uh, versus communist movements. He tended to assume almost every nationalist movement is a communist movement. And so I think he ended up actually misdiagnosing Arab nationalism. It wasn't sort of a Soviet enterprise. It was the demagogic uh, uh, master, it was the demagogic tactics uh, of Nasser. And in some ways, uh, probably the British and French uh, reaction was actually uh, did not really bring in the Soviets, and uh, and in some ways it actually led to effective resolution. And I think that if you could diagnose the difference between a sort of nationalist movement led by a demagogue versus what it was truly a communist uh, expansion, then um, it would it it could have it could have led to different foreign policies tailored to deal with those. Uh, specific issues. So I think Eisenhower tended to confuse these nationalist movements with communist movements. There was another great episode too of this in Guatemala. Uh, there was a sort of local uh, kind of uh, local dictator who had began nationalizing uh, land controlled by American investments uh, named Arbenz. And again, Eisenhower regarded this as this kind of nationalist movement as a uh, as communist expansion. And the, I mean, it ended up making a bigger deal out of a situation that, in fact, could have been, you know, handled in a in a sort of more uh, strategic way. So the, in some ways, I think in terms of his foreign policy too, he often the one of the problems was confusing uh, communism with with nationalism. Yeah, very very interesting. Um, if I can just uh, stay on the theme of the foreign policy for a second, somebody. Um, in a comment, I can't remember who it was, may, may have been Billy, uh, mentioned Dulles, John Foster Dulles. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if that either of you can say something about Eisenhower's relationship with Dulles. Uh, to what extent was Dulles um, driving Eisenhower's foreign policy? Um, or was it vice versa? I, I'm wondering, you know, let me, let me <laughs> jump around a little bit here. In one of the letters, I think it's the letter. From uh, from Edgar, uh, or from uh, Dwight Eisenhower to Edgar, where he uh, addresses this claim 
that uh, Eisenhower is getting bad political advice and that he's surrounded by a group of Machiavellian characters. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, first of all, what if, if either of you know what that's a reference to? Is it a reference to Dulles? But also, secondly, what is what is the relationship of Dulles uh, with with Eisenhower? Because my understanding is Dulles was the primary author of um, of, uh, of the New Look, with greater reliance on nuclear uh, deterrence uh, and less reliance on what's called traditional uh, boots on the ground sorts of. Um, resources to deal with communism. Any thoughts on either of those two things? Joe? I was going to defer to you. Go ahead, David, yeah. No, go ahead. You go ahead. Well, so the, the Edgar letter is very early. This is uh, November 1954, so it's very early on. Um, so I'm not sure what the reference is there, but I don't, I don't think there's any note here that gives us any indication at all. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, Ike is very angry <laughs> at any insinuation that his advisors are leading him astray. Right. Um, and he wants to see actual evidence. That's his big claim here in the letter to Edgar. Um, so I'm not fully aware of, you know, the extent to which Dulles was influencing these, these decisions. And I think that's something David might be able to answer. But um, I don't necessarily think that's the reference here in this letter, just because of the timing of it. Thank you. Yeah, good point. But, but uh, Dulles really was, I think, the big influence uh, in probably beyond just uh, uh, just in terms of his foreign policy. I think in in many ways, uh, Dulles was probably the biggest influence both domestically and in terms of foreign policy. Dulles was the one person that Eisenhower really saw eye to eye with. They really understood each other and enjoyed a, a very chummy relationship. Uh, so that, you know, in, in uh, I think, uh, uh, Dulles is dying of cancer by the last year of the uh, presidency of, um, of Eisenhower in 1959. And Eisenhower was at his bedside uh, most of the time. So they were, they, they were very close. And it is true that, that Dulles um, is the influence behind the foreign policy, including a sort of balanced foreign policy. On the one hand, you want to really lead with the constant threat of uh, 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 using uh, an atomic bomb or nuclear war. And, um, you know, for instance, there had been a battle over these two islands. I always forget, uh, uh, forget their names in the Taiwan Straits. And, you know, the, I mean, these are two tiny islands and they, you know, uh, Eisenhower leaves on the table. You know, I may go to nuclear war over these uh, two islands, because America's reputation really had to do with um, uh, holding, uh, 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 with uh, preserving the sovereignty of Taiwan. So the um, Dulles, uh, it was, a, but it was a balanced foreign policy as well. So that Dulles was also behind uh, the idea that we should, on the one hand, build up nuclear weapons. On the other hand, we should have what is called an open skies policy. That is, you know, countries, right, exercise espionage and checking out each other's um, um, military buildups. We should, we should just uh, allow for that. That is, let each side know, you know, what, what is it that you have? Um, so that in some ways you want to kind of broadcast your foreign policy. Um, so the, in some ways, the, the nuclear strategy was really broadcasting we could do this, therefore you don't want to do this. And I, that, Dulles, I think, really was the mastermind behind that. Yeah, that reminds me of a quote from Reagan who said, um, the, only way that, the only way deterrence works as a foreign policy tool is if, if, if you have the capability to do something, the other side knows you have the capability to do it, and that you're willing to do it Yeah. if, if it's called on, right? If you don't have those three things, then obviously it's useless, so... Uh, that, but that's a, that's a dangerous game, of course, and that introduces, of course, we're familiar with the term brinksmanship and yeah. uh, and these things, right? Because there's that line where how far do you actually go to prove that you're willing to use your your resources, your tools, your foreign policy tools? How far well, and, do you want to go? And, and, and that was the particular challenge for Eisenhower was how to carry out the brinksmanship without... Uh, Without you know, in a in a in a modest and humble way. I mean, how do you do brinksmanship and um and um with modesty? And I think he was often struggling on, you know, how uh, how how far to carry it. Um, you know, in some ways, 
in some circumstances, he was really very successful at it. Uh, in other uh, situations, I think particularly with Khrushchev, uh, he was he he would uh, look to accommodate rather than push the brinksmanship to the point where it really needed to be effective. So it, it's a challenging policy to implement and, and how you, far you go. The other thing too is, is that when your opponents call missile gap, you know, that really hurts you when you're trying to play brinksmanship. Great point. Yeah, so he's earlier used the phrase modest assertion of executive power. It's it's hard to have a modest, to have a policy of modest assertion of uh, nuclear weapons capabilities or something like that. <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> How do you do that? That's a great point. Um, I, we have about 10 minutes or so left, so if you don't mind, gentlemen, I'd like to go kind of full circle, kind of back to where we started with this. The, the, the theme that's emerged is the sort of en the very enigmatic character of Eisenhower, uh, Eisenhower's presidency. And one of the first questions submitted, I think, was actually from Brian, who wanted to talk about um, uh, Eisenhower's recess appointment of, of William Brennan. And before we, I'd like your thoughts on that because that seems an especially timely question, uh, given the, um, the the passing of uh, Justice Scalia uh, recently. But before we before we do that, I want to raise a quote, one of the most interesting quotes uh, I think, and this is from Eisenhower's letter to Edgar Eisenhower. It's the second paragraph where he says, "You keep harping on the Constitution." I should like to point out that the meaning of the Constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. Uh, so he makes that claim, which, of course, if you take it, take that seriously, Eisenhower recognizes, believes that the Supreme Court has the final say in a way over what the Constitution means. And he takes that, therefore, very seriously. And yet he appoints William Brennan who, as we know, is, is if not the most, or is one of the most liberal justices of the 20th century. How do we, how do we reconcile, or how do we think about that? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you backed away from the word reconcile because it may not be possible. <laughs> how, do we think of, how do we think about right. it? Um, no, that's a terrible line. I mean, that ter you know, the second paragraph, right, the meaning of the Constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. That's a, that's a terrible line. Maybe... One of, one of the worst things you know he's ever written um so this goes against so many presidents who said well the constitution is uh can be interpreted by all three branches of government and so we don't just read the cases to find out what the constitution means we think about what the constitution means and we look at everybody who has the power to implement it and to interpret it um the brennan point right uh eisenhower famously came to regret that nomination Right. I can't remember the exact line, but he says later, you know, this is one of my biggest mistakes. Um, but you're right. It raises the bigger question here. And so I, I thought about the big question, right? What do we make of Eisenhower? Is he a good president? Is he a great president? Is he mediocre? And I think there are two maybe conclusions that, that I'm coming to as a result of this conversation are first, um, if we as scholars try to analyze him through the scholarly lens or the academic lens and therefore try to fit everything he does inside of a framework that makes logical sense and can be tied to principles, I think we will fail. But if we just try to interpret him as a political actor in which he's trying to keep the ship of state on a middle course, I think he makes a lot of sense that way. And so maybe part of it is our prejudice in order we try to study these people as thinkers and philosophers as opposed to just practical politicians. The second thing, though, and this maybe cuts against the first, so I'm still confused, perhaps, um, is that this fifth, what is it, the fifth paragraph of that Edgar letter, uh, which is a very famous paragraph where he says, um, should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, eliminate labor laws, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. This is the sentence that says, I'm making my peace with the New Deal, and the Republican Party is making its peace with the New Deal. Um, I think there are a lot of people who would, could be conservatives and agree with that sentence. As long as one is getting something done and doing what's possible in light of a principle, I think that makes perfect sense. The problem that Eisenhower seems to present is, the possible seems to replace the principle as opposed to being achieved in light of the principle. And that's, I think, the big question here 
that um, it's very hard to answer with Eisenhower is, yes, of course, he's talking about balance and moderation and doing what's possible. But is he do is he trying to do that for its own sake or is he trying to achieve a principle inside of those political realities? Yeah, that's fa- that's fascinating. I'm still trying. OK, can you say that again, Joe? Is it the, uh, so uh, I think the principle versus the possible thing, if you don't mind. Right. I, I think a lot of people could have accepted Eisenhower from the from the right or from the conservative side of things if he were just trying to be moderate because politically that was what was possible, so that he was trying to achieve a principle in light of the possible. What I think Eisenhower potentially presents is a replacement of principles by what is possible. Say, well, here's what we can do, and therefore we ought to do it. I see. And because it's there, because it's it's. Um... He doesn't. He doesn't support Social Security or oppose Social Security on a principled basis. It just has become part of our let's call it constitutional character, and to do away with it is impossible. So it's it's just a it's just a practical uh, sort of assertion of a, a fact. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And buttressed by the fact that the Supreme Court already upheld it. Right. So it's all off the political table in general anyway. Uh, it's uh, it's just sort of makes you wonder what what, what he's What's the guiding idea here? What's the guiding motivation or purpose? That, by the way, Joe, that really sheds light on the meaning of that sentence I read earlier, where he says, I like to point out the meaning of the Constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. Or, or it, it provides deeper, uh, deeper significance for that sentence. Yeah, yeah that's great. great. Uh, I was going to ask you uh, in our last few minutes, uh, this is, I thought that was a, this is a timely question about the role of the Supreme Court uh, in light of the fact that everybody's just going, Nuts over over you know, both on both sides of the, of the political spectrum are going nuts over how critical it is to get a particular justice with a with a particular political point of view in, in the on, on the court. But uh, another timely question might be um, in light of the um, uh, uh, the primaries going on. Uh, and Joe, you started to touch on this. I wonder if either of you would elaborate on it a little bit more. What effect does Eisenhower have on the Republican Party? Either short term or even long term, does is there something about Eisenhower that that makes possible a kind of uh, emergence of a conservatism in the in the late fifties, early sixties that leads to a redefinition of the Republican Party by the time Reagan's in office? Yeah, I mean, I might be maybe this is too bold, but I might say the influence of Eisenhower on the Republican Party today is that there is none. Um, that's well, yeah, that's interesting. So. Very few few people within the party. Yeah, that, that, that she's just not really a figure that people, you, know, you either go back to Reagan or you go all the way back to Coolidge. And some go to Lincoln and the framers, but Eisenhower seems to be sort of lost in that muddle. That's fascinating. D- David, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, on that question too, I would say that um, uh, exactly the same thing as Joe. I mean, who do you ever see? I mean, what Republican do you ever see say, you know, I want to be like Eisenhower, right? Um, (laughs) And so in some ways he's disappeared as a sort, uh, as a, uh, as a profound figure um, or an influential figure for the, uh, for, for the party. I mean, on the other hand, you have a lot of presidents who have acted like Eisenhower, right? Uh, So Eisenhower referred to himself as a progressive conservative, uh, George W. Bush referred to himself as a compassionate conservative. I mean, you have a lot of people sort of acting like Eisenhower, but would never use Eisenhower as their example for who I am. You don't see Bush saying, "I believe in progressive or conservatism," just like uh, Dwight D. Dwight D. Eisenhower, which in some ways probably does point to the fact of. Uh, what the fate of of trying to develop a position that um, that synthesizes both sides is? I think you know George W. Bush suffered in some ways exactly the same problems that that Eisenhower did in articulating a sort of coherent uh, set of principles to guide uh, either foreign policy or domestic policy, and you see the uh, fallout of that. I think in this. Uh, in this in this primary uh, now, so in some ways the, there's there's not a lot of invocation of Eisenhower, but there's a lot of imitation of Eisenhower, and the imitation of Eisenhower often leads to the the sad.
conclusion. I think it does point to the fact that um, the, the better understanding of moderation, the one that's more effective in the long run, is one where you have principal convictions that then are accommodated to uh, partic uh, particular circumstances. Yeah, that's 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 really. I'm sorry, David. I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, one last thing I would mention too, in that in that letter to I, uh, to uh, Edgar Eisenhower too. You know, Eisen, the, the, obviously his brother is complaining, right, about how you're really not a Republican, right? Because the, the brother is guided by the, the old guard Republicans, right? The staunch opponents of uh, FDR. And Edgar uh, Eisenhower was known for his hatred of uh, FDR. And what he's challenging Eisenhower on here is, he says, you know, like, for instance, when it comes to domestic policy, um, you're instituting controls. That is those those New Deal regulations, right, of the economy that fix things like wages and lay hours of labor and and, th and and farm prices and things like that. And the Eisenhower is just uh, President Eisenhower is shocked by these charges. He says there's no controls, right? And the thing is, is that you wonder, well, how how could they not know? I mean, like one side says you're instituting controls, and Eisenhower says there are no controls. And this is a great illustration of, in some ways, the lack of clear principles emerging from the Eisenhower administration. So it is true that Eisenhower was at work behind the scenes trying to get rid of, like, these price uh, controls on farm uh, produce, on agricultural produce. But in order to balance that, he would always allow some sort of other type of uh, scheme for inflating the value of agricultural commodities. So he would get rid of the New Deal controls, but then allow for some uh, uh, substitute that essentially did the same thing. And so you can see the brothers, uh, they, they seem to talk past one another. And part of it is because of the lack of sort of clear policy uh, principles that I think are, are, are to guide uh, these choices made by the Eisenhower administration. And I think you see the same thing in the problem with uh, 20th century presidents, 21st century presidents, who have tried to imitate uh, Eisenhower. If there, can, if we have time, can I just say two quick things in response to that? Um, uh, David, I think, is making a very good point here that the reason the Eisenhower model doesn't work is because you have to explain your principles very clearly if you're going to exercise this sort of subtle back-channel influence as president. Um, but I think, and this, you know, we're talking about Eisenhower's influence today. I think there are two important reasons why Eisenhower's lack of influence today is a very bad thing for our politics. Um, so I want to say some good things about Eisenhower and the model here. Um, the first is um, moderation, and it shows the decline of any sort of philosophy of moderation and balance in today's politics, which is a very disheartening and very problematic development for any sort of de democracy that needs deliberation and compromise and bargaining. Um, because any candidate that talks about balance and moderation today just isn't going to have any influence. And I think that's one really bad thing that you can see in our politics today as a result that Eisenhower's lack of influence reflects. The other thing is, you know, I, I wrote once that uh, Eisenhower belongs on the um, restrained Mount Rushmore with Washington, Coolidge, and Taft. So we should have two Mount Rushmores, the Imperial Mount Rushmore, and then the restrained one. And I think Eisenhower actually belongs on the restrained one. Um, and I think the fact that no president today can appeal to Eisenhower's restraint as a way of gaining office is another very problematic element of our politics. On both sides of the aisle, presidents are basically promising to solve all of the world's problems unilaterally. And I think that shows another way in which Eisenhower is no longer influential, but a real problem with today's politics. Yeah, that's amazing. By the way, I... I uh, what both of you just said in your last uh, last comments, I think anybody who watched the, especially the Republican debate uh, Thursday night, sees a lot of lessons that can be drawn from, uh, from Eisenhower's example. <laughs> I don't think we need to say anything else. We are coming almost to the end of our time, so, but one last question, if you don't mind, and it kind of again takes us back to the beginning. Nick wants to know if um, if the party and history in general don't look to Ike still as an explicit influence. Why do you think he's still ranked so highly as he is in the polls uh, yeah. that are taken by uh, of the American people on these things? Why is he still regarded highly, at least by by the American people? 
Right. Um, well, I think one thing is the historians rank him very highly. And so a lot of these these polls and surveys involve historians. Historians generally, as a, as a category, will lean towards favoring those presidents who um, preserved, promoted, expanded the New Deal and other kinds of initiatives. And so his support for the New Deal, his, his relative sort of liberalism, um, I think makes him popular among historians. I think the 50s in general are a very quiet and prosperous decade. And I think that's why both historians and the people like Eisenhower, he, he has a bit of the Clinton effect, um, you know, where the 90s were just sort of nice decade and he got to be in the office at that time. And so it kind of makes him look very popular. So I think Eisenhower gets a bit of a Clinton bump in that respect. And that's probably one one or two factors. Those those two factors might help explain it. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, the thing I think most people can remember from Eisenhower's uh, presidency or mostly from his campaigns is the slogan, I like Ike. He's, he's the likable president. And what in some ways makes him likable and, and memorable to the extent that he is memorable is the fact that he really did strive for a non partisan executive. And I think in some ways that there's something appealing. There's something is, is while there's not a lot of invocation of Eisenhower, you don't see people denouncing Eisenhower. Right? Um, and so the thing is, is that that I think in some ways he embodies a sort of aspiration that we all have, which is, is that we would like to see uh, our political order transcend partisanship. I think, though, that the presidents who are most effective in doing that um, are the ones who really understand that you you have to be committed uh, to certain principles and that you have to guide partisanship uh, to support that. And so I think that in the end, Eisenhower wasn't really effective in achieving his own vision, which was uh, to uh, somehow help the executive branch transcend uh, transcend partisanship. I think in the end, he really got weighed down by it. That, that's really, really, really interesting. Uh, one last quick question. Uh, often we ask uh, people to join us for recommendations for good books on Eisenhower. Can it, any recommendations on what people might read to, to continue with this? Yeah, I think the, the great the great book um, on this for the domestic policy side is by a fellow named Fred, Fred Greenstein, and it's called The Hidden Hand Presidency. Um, and this is the attempt to show that Eisenhower was much more active and involved in politics than that detached persona that he led on. So that I think um, that I think is the best book on his domestic policy legacy. Yeah, I, uh, that's the book I would recommend. I mean, you really learn a lot about the presidency and how the executive branch works from uh, from Greenstein's the the hidden hand. Uh, presidency. I think that's probably uh, I, that's the one I would recommend the most. And then a uh, historical treatment of uh, Eisenhower, I'd recommend, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, Steve Ambrose's. Uh, oh, book. that's right. Yeah, right. Stephen Ambrose. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you very much. I uh, I mean this sincerely. I, I have learned a lot from our conversation. Um, you guys are clearly uh, very, very knowledgeable about this stuff. And um, I appreciate your time and and uh, and your sharing your thoughts and and, and knowledge on this. I uh, enjoy, enjoyed it very much. So thanks again for being here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Yeah. This was fun. Enjoyed it. Yeah, it is fun. And uh, I want to thank our our um, uh, teachers and others who have joined us today for submitting some good questions. Uh, please consider looking into the Master of Arts program if you've enjoyed this webinar. This is how we do things uh, in our classes generally. Our next Saturday webinar will be April 9th, same time, on Lyndon Johnson, the Great Society in Vietnam, and will be joined by Kevin Porteous of Hillsdale College and William Addo of the University of Dallas. Uh, we've already posted the recommended, recommended readings for that webinar, so hopefully you can join us then. Uh, best until then. Take care, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>